awesomeness. Is there enough? No, clearly not. If there was, this room would be empty. We'd all be riding jetpacks on our way to ninja training or something. Um, so what this is really, in my view, is sort of uh, an effort to close the awesomeness gap, right? To, or narrow it, at least. Uh, my own effort is a show called Right Club, which I founded in Chicago in 2010. Right Club is three bouts of two opposing writers, two opposing ideas. They get an assignment in advance, they get seven minutes apiece, the audience picks a winner, and proceeds go to charity. Um, <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Right Club is now in five cities. Uh, it has uh, raised about $7,000 and given away to charity. And it is spread uh, exclusively on word of mouth and free social media. But I'm not here to recruit you to Right Club. Right Club is an idea worth spreading, but it's spreading on its own. What I want to tell you about is where Right Club came from and maybe help you figure out a way that you can devise your own means of narrowing the awesomeness gap. Um, first, let's define our term. Awesomeness, to me, must embody the following. It's got to be fun. Fun is the gravity that will draw people to the planet awesome. It's got to be smart. There is enough exasperating dumbness in the world. Let's not add to it. It's got to be authentic. I went to high school in the 1980s, which means I listened to the dead Kennedys and believed, rightly, that Phil Collins should be bulldozed into a trench. It's got to be real, actual people in shared space in real time. Technology is a wonderful thing. It's been a great asset to Right Club, but I believe experiences on a screen or through a device are of a lower order of potency than things that happen in the real world. Um, it's got to be minimal. List all the things that you think you need to make your idea happen and then subtract half of them. Cut away the fat and gristle so that all that's left is lean, delicious muscle. And this is the secret weapon, I believe, in awesomeness, is it should be helpful. Right Club gives everything away. And a really exciting artistic model, disastrous business model. <laughs> um, the thing that separates a cool show from an awesome show, to me, is a cool show has impact and is memorable. An awesome show has impact, is memorable, and is helpful and tries to do good. And the last thing is, make it a movement. Don't be stingy with intellectual property, okay? Don't steal my idea. I will give it to you. I will give it to you to do with as you please. Uh, just talk to me, agree to, uh, you know, adhere to certain principles, and you can have it. But what I want you to do is come up with your own version of this kind of thing, okay? So, <clears throat> where did Right Club come from? Uh, as a lot of awesome things, it came from a pretty uh, bleak time. Uh, in late 2009 was a crappy time for me. Uh, I was artistically stalled. My day job as a fundraiser for an arts organization was a huge drag. <laughs> uh, the economic downturn has been just uncommonly pummeling to the arts sector. And even in the best of times, fundraising for the arts is concerned with its own survival. It's not, it's, 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 any, it's like the polar bear that's swimming toward the ice flow. It might make it, it might not, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I was interested in seeing if it was possible to create something that is mighty, right? 
that is not rooted in meekness or need, but that gives everything away as fast as it can, right? So um, <clears throat> here's what I want you to steal. Here's what I want you to do. The way Right Club came about was I did an audit of myself. I said, what are my skills? What do I care about? How do I kick ass? <laughs> Who can I enlist as my co-conspirators to help move this thing forward? And uh, lastly, because mine is a, sh is a show, what makes a killer arts experience? So take what you know, who you have, and make of it what you can. And here's the thing is that like, you know, there's a lot of production values here in this. This is not Right Club. Right Club happens in a bar. Right Club is a show that needs a music stand, a mic, and some papers and somebody reading, and that's it. So you can achieve extraordinary things with just about nothing. And that's what we're about to show you right now. Um, uh, we're gonna do an abbreviated Right Club bout. Right Club is usually, uh, as I said, seven minutes per side. We're gonna do five minutes a piece. Uh, local writer John Jeter is gonna join me. Uh, please help me welcome to the stage. <laughs> and we are going to do uh, work versus play. I am work, he is play. And now we are no longer at TEDx, we are at a Right Club show. And as a Right Club audience, you must know that any response you give to anything that happens on the stage must be verbal. Is that understood? Yes. Very good. Here we go. Okay. The only fair way for us to determine the order of combatants in a right club bout is that it be random. And science dictates that the only fair way to determine the order is rock, paper, scissors. Understood? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna help us count it off. Here is the protocol. One, two, three, blam. Can you do that? Yeah. All right, let's hear it. One, two, three, blam! Like so. Understood? Got it. Okay. That was a test run. Here we go. Ready? So we throw on blam. Got it? A blam. Okay. Help us count it off. One, two, three, blam! All right, once more. One, two, three, blam! The choice is yours. Would you like to go first or second? You go first. I will go first. Very good. <sighs> okay. This is work versus play, once again. Here we go. Play. Play is fun, maybe, but it doesn't matter to you. Confucius famously observed, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Later that same week, Confucius also said, if Debbie in marketing does not give it a rest with her cats, I swear to God I will open my wrists in the break room. <laughs> Sage words, as true today as when he wrote them 2,000 years ago. <laughs> this is the thing, the difference between work and a job. Work fires your imagination and imbues you with a sense of purpose. It creates a sense of flow and drive and propulsion in your life. It is a journey and destination, aim and end. You do your work whether you have to or not. You wedge it into the tiniest crevice in your schedule. You continue no matter how dense and complex your life becomes. Examples. Hitler's job was to be der Fuhrer. His work was to be a painter, which is an important lesson. If you know what your work is, don't suck at it. Because <laughs> you will be in, end up super pissed like Hitler. Einstein's job was to be a patent clerk. His work was to forever alter our perception of space-time. This is another good lesson. If you can swing it at all, be a genius. <laughs> if you're Tom Cruise, your job is to fan the embers of your waning celebrity. Your work is to be a tiny, closeted mouthpiece for a creepy non-religion. <laughs> your job 
Your job is a set of shears. Your time on earth is a bolt of fabric. Your fabric is precious. It is the only time you possess. But so then these shears come along with all these, er, cutting all these irregular shapes in your fabric, compromising your vision of what, what this fabric was to become. The pattern of your life well lived might, have, might resemble to you a floor length garment like a dashiki. Every hour you spend at your job and getting there and back and every stray thought you have about some bullshit thing your boss said two days ago, all these moments are of all your days you squander on a job are stolen from your fabric. As a consequence of this, the dashiki of your life is no longer possible because all the snipping and trimming and slicing of these shears, you will be lucky if you can salvage a pair of culottes <laughs> from the fabric of your own life. Instead of the stately and regal dashiki, you're stuck with these culottes that are unflattering and more than a little demeaning. Your ass looks huge, they are badly out of season, and you've squandered your adult life on the construction of these culottes, which your friends all agree was a bad miscalculation. <laughs> this is not the case with work. Your work is something you will defend. Where work is concerned, when you get a bullshit call, you will not let it stand. You will blitz the line, Judge, in McEnroe style. You cannot be serious! <laughs> At a job, when somebody shits on you, you just shrug and check your watch and hit the vending machines, and you're like, ooh, crackle bar. <laughs> and forget all about it. And I mean, look at yourself, man. You're settling for a crackle bar, a waxy, flavorless crackle bar, dude. Work sustains you. A job feeds off you like a tapeworm. <laughs> you get stoked about work. You are ground down by your job. You are a giant killer in your work. You are a pissant in your job. You are a sex machine in your work. At your job, you are a eunuch. <laughs> and if you talk about your position, what you have there, my friend, is a job you hate, but you, you're pathetically trying to convince people is something amazing and prestigious. Your profession is still a job, but you have to go to school for a long-ass time to get it. <laughs> if you have a gig, you're trying to convince us that your job is cool, which it is not. <laughs> your career is a string of jobs, so you can track your failure over time as you trapeze <laughs> from one irrelevance to another. Work, real work, matters to you. Maybe not as much as your kids or your wife or your dog, but it matters an awful lot. If there is a fire, you know the five things you need to grab to continue your work. The things that you cannot let burn because they are just <clears throat> too important. If there is a fire at your job, you will walk away without snagging a thing. You will stand across the street watching blankly as that shithole burns to the ground. <laughs> Clear your minds. Clear your minds. John Jeter. Remember, we're in a bar, so everybody raise yeah. your beer and clear your palate. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's good and hammered right now. Okay. John Jeter, are you ready, sir? I'm ready, sir. All right. John Jeter for play in three, two, one, begin. Blam. Chapter one. It kills me, you know, this whole play thing. I'm in the music business. You know what the music business is? It's work. It's a hell of a lot of work. And here, where I am, at the bottom of the food chain in the music business, you want to know what kind of work we do? We work for a few people who take our stage every night, night after night. And you know what they get to do? They get to play. <laughs> I'm talking about working on behalf of the chronically unemployed. Yes, the musicians, <laughs> the artists, the misfits of the world. And what do they get to do? They get to play. Have you ever heard anyone talk about how Springsteen or the Rolling Stones work music? No, they play music. And they get paid for it, too. Some of them get paid one hell of a lot to play. Sort of like pro football players. Oh, yeah, they're playing, too. <laughs> you call that work? And who pays these people, these artists and athletes, who work for a living with playing? Well, working schlubs like us do, that's who. I'm talking about the fans, us poor slobs who have to work. Yes, work for our money. And then you have to work to get your entertainment on, too. You work to arrange a night out. You turn over your hard-earned money and all that work and all the work that you put into earning your money. Where does it go? To watch people 
play. <clears throat> when was the last time you got to say that you got to play for your paycheck? Chapter 2. Okay, so we folks in the music business who work behind the scenes while the people who get to make the money get to play for it, well, that's why we got in the music business in the first place. Sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Well, to work so that other people can play. Now, now I sound like a soccer mom, but I'm not bitter, not by a long shot. Yeah, that's my point, see? The play is the thing, and all the world's a stage. I think the Ramones or Dylan said that. Anyway, I offer a stage where all the world comes to play, and the best part is we get to watch them. That, my friends, and my dear, poor, overworked Ian, is what it's all about. After all, isn't the play the thing? Chapter 3. I'm all hung up on this whole art versus commerce thing. To me, I guess, and to a lot of people, art is play. Commerce, as far as I can tell, is work. Let's say that you work at a bank or you're a lawyer or you punch a clock at a bakery. You don't say, have a good day, honey. I'm going to play. Yeah, probably not. Instead, you probably say, oh, hell, we all know what you're going to say. We do it all every day. Then you've got the artists. Okay, I'll grant you. A lot of them say, hey, I've got to work on my project. I have to go work in my studio. I have to go work on, yeah, well, wah, whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell me that drifting off into right brain la-la land to romp around with your imaginary friends or commune with the creator is work. Tell me that's not play. As far as I'm concerned, it is play. It might be hard work, but come on, people, it's play. Okay, so I have a, co I have a confession to make. I, I used to think of myself as a writer, even an artiste. But somewhere along the way, I discovered that writing, real nose to the grindstone, open your veins, blow your brains wide open, that kind of writing, that's hard work. Screw that. <laughs> <clears throat> I'd rather be out riding my bike. Like today, it's gorgeous outside. We should all be out there. Instead of working our brains in here, we should be out there playing with everybody else. Or better yet, listening to music or flirting. I mean, what did Adam and Eve do for a living? <laughs> you think those palm trees were work clothes? I mean, that's the kind of effort I'm talking about. See, that's the good stuff right there. That's not just play, that's bliss. Chapter 4. My grandfather used to say that his heart swelled whenever he saw good people do hard work, and he wasn't watching them either. He worked alongside them. He worked hard his whole life. His son, my dad, used to say, hard work never killed anybody. Well, yeah, I'm not so sure. At the end of the day, I think work's a bad idea, just as a general policy. It's all very well to believe that hardworking people tend to appreciate other people who work hard. But the, the world is filled with sad sacks like that. Me? I think it takes monster amounts of creativity to avoid work. And avoiding work is, say it with me, play. So at the end of all this, what is play? Let's look at it this way. Play is art. Art is creation. Creation is play. And life, if you want to duplicate art over and over and over again through most of the moments of your life, why that's recreation. Recreation. And to me... That's a life well played. All right. <laughs> All right. Now, if this was a tavern and this was a real Right Club show, you guys would be determining right now the victor of this bout. But we're not in a tavern. So go find a Right Club show or go start one yourself or make your own version of this kind of thing. Because as you saw, there was an exciting uh, opposition there, and all it took was a microphone and some papers and some ideas, right? So go forth ye and do the same. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>